is, if you're listening to this message, more than likely it's because there's a call and there's a conviction on your heart from the Holy Spirit, right? From the God of the Bible that is calling you to a different, to a deeper place that is more authentic and more in tune with what he's doing in this hour, right? In the contemporary gospel that we see being produced out there, it's contrary to what the Father is doing, and it is designed to directly oppose what is happening in this hour. So you'll hear, you'll hear it's becoming more terms like non-denominational and different things like that, um, which is not, is not necessarily a bad thing. I do believe that the Father desires his body of Christ to be non-denominational, right? He doesn't desire us to be divided, but the reality is, is, is the contemporary definitions we have to look at, we have to really understand like what contemporary means. And the reason why we have to look at this word is because there's a reason why this word emerged on the church scene. There's a reason why this word emerged when it came time to deal with the gospel, right? So we see the definition here is marked by characteristic of the present period, modern or current, right? And we also see happening, existing, living, or coming into being during the same time period or the same period of time. This is an important definition because a synonym that a lot of people don't know is attached to the word contemporary is... As an adjective, it is is the synonym is coexist, right? So when we hear about this aspect of like being contemporary and being more modern and being more current and different things like that, I'm not saying that the church and the, and the, and the body of Christ should not be in, in tune with what's going on in the earth, right? Like we should not. I'm not saying we shouldn't be able to to relate and minister the gospel according to the era that we live in, what I'm highlighting is this aspect of there's a reason why sometimes everybody wants to to modernize or make things current, right, or bring things into a certain time period, right? And, and the purpose for that, what I, a lot of people understand in it is the fact that this contemporary message or this more modern message, it, it without a lot of people realizing is it deals with this aspect of coexisting, Right. So when we define coexist, when we define this word coexist, what we have to see is that coexist means to exist together or at the same time or to live in peace with each other, especially as a matter of policy. Right. Coexist means to exist together or at the same time. And it also means to live in peace with each other, especially as a matter of policy. Right. So. Bearing that in mind. I want you guys to really begin to look at it, right? Look at this aspect of the culture that typically surrounds a more contemporary body, that typically surrounds a more contemporary faith system. And the reason why this is significant is because when you start to see how these things correlate, Right. When you start to see how these words are synonymous and some, and can be interchangeable and different things like that, then it helps you understand why Satan does what he does to try to push these faith, these cultures and infuse it with the faith of the Bible. Across different across different um, specters of, of understanding. Right. Because we know what Satan is all about. Right. So this is why you'll see. And uh, this is why you'll see in more contemporary churches, and this and this push to be more modern and current. This is where you'll see compromises in holiness under the guise of, "Oh, that was only that was for the Bible days, right?" Or you'll start to see compromises in holiness that says, "Like, well, times are different now. You know, well, that was the old way. We're more modern now, or times change, so the word has to change to match the times, right?" This is this whole concept about this contemporary gospel and this contemporary, this contemporary culture that is being infused in the body of Christ, right? And the whole agenda that Satan has behind that is because it is all 
setting the stage for this aspect of coexisting. This is why people don't like to preach on sin anymore. This is why people don't like to preach on what is being labeled as like religion and legalism and different things like that, right? This is why there's an erasing, an erasing of the standard of the Most High God of Israel, right? Because when you don't have that standard and you start to create all these things and you start to, to remove certain aspects, you set the stage for this coexistence to happen. Because if there is no sin, then I can no longer say that there is a stand. I can no longer say there's a right and a wrong, right? You believe what you want to believe and you're entitled to that. I believe what I'm in. I want to believe and I'm entitled to that, right? Like all roads lead to God and different things like that. that that's where you start to hear all of these different. And then that's where we start to get in this aspect of like, you know, not judging one another and X, Y, and Z, because it's all about this aspect of coexisting, living in peace and living in harmony and all of these different things, right? And one thing that's significant is it says to exist together or at the same time and to live in peace with each other, especially as a matter of policy. And when you look at a lot of the the unwritten rules or laws, I would say, of some of these more contemporary-based gospels and contemporary-based churches, what you'll see is there's a there's an unwritten law right that bypasses certain standards of this holy god that we live according to based on our faith in christ in order to be at peace and to coexist with those who have a different point of view right and and you we we know some of the mega churches and things that have already been bashed and you know drug through the mud because of like their different doctors and stuff like that but if you but that's why these that's why the father allows us to cut like these different interviews and stuff like that to occur to be made public so people can understand what is the heart and the spirit behind what is really operating in some of these 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 congregations and different things like that or these leaders that are within these congregations all right so let's keep moving forward so the challenge with this contemporary view or this contemporary gospel is the reality that the bible has always been exclusive right the bible has always called his people and God, the, the Father has always called His people in the Bible to be to be ca uh, called out, right? Called to come out of the world, right? To be in the world but not of the world. We are called to be set apart, right? We are called to be holy and to touch not the unclean thing. We are called to be exclusive and set apart and consecrated from anything that is contrary to the Father and His ways. Any, every time you look into the Bible and you study the scripture, you will always see the Father has always been exclusive. And the beautiful thing about that is because like the way that Satan will twist this word exclusive when you're talking about the Bible is Satan will come and be like, oh, well, that's judgmental or that's not right. And like he'll, he'll hit you with all of these different things. Right. Like but when it comes to the things of the world, nobody has an issue with the word exclusive. But it's only when it comes to the body of Christ. Right. When the Father has called us to be an exclusive people, right? He doesn't mean that we deny anyone to to have faith in Christ, or we don't we don't exclude anyone from the gospel. We don't exclude anyone from coming to to receive this gift of salvation. What it's talking about is He desires us to be exclusive of those things which would lead us to sin, which would compromise the integrity of this word and the standard which He has established, and which would compromise the truth that we stand on for which our Savior died. If that makes sense, right? But in the world, we don't have a problem being part of an exclusive, like, you know, we want to be in this exclusive VIP club. We want to be on the exclusive list. We want to get the new exclusive shoes or whatever it is, right? So we don't have a problem understanding exclusive to be in a way that, that shows like it is something that is is distinguished from like, so when you think about an exclusive, uh, an exclusive pair of shoes, you want those exclusives because everyone knows it's different then what is it's, it's out of the norm it's not common right and because it's uncommon there's this value that's placed on it that has a positive light but when we talk about this aspect of the bible being exclusive people are challenged with that and that's because it is a contradiction for this inclusive gospel that's being breathed through this contemporary message that is being breathed throughout the earth right but that's not what the bible shows us all right. So um, the reason why this poses a challenge for most people is because, you know, Satan's favorite color is gray. Right. He loves his color gray. He loves these gray areas because he loves to do everything that is offensive to the most high God. He does. He loves to do everything that's going to get us in trouble with the one that he can't beat. Like Satan cannot beat a child of God 
when we are hidden in the Father, but he can put us in a position where, you know, we become at enmity with the Father, right? We know this from the book of James. So Satan loves his great area because Satan understands that the reality is, is in the Bible, in the, word of, in the word of God, there are no great areas with the God of Israel, right? He, he said you have two choices. You can walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. You can't walk in the two at the same time. He says you can walk in a manner of life or you can walk in a manner of death. You can choose the way of life or you can choose the way of death. There, there is no middle ground with that. But the, 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 we love to latch on to this thing about gray areas. And when you really look at the body of Christ, whenever someone talks about that's a gray area or they speak of this concept of a gray area, what it really is is that gray area is a, is a revelation of the fact that either they have not heard the truth about a certain thing or they heard the truth about it, but they didn't want to yield to it. So to, to give peace to those who have rebelled in a certain area that the Father may have convicted them, we talk about, oh, that's a great area and that doesn't really matter, right? And that is a dangerous place to be because that is not scripturally accurate, right? What the scripture teaches us is some individuals may have different convictions at different times based on the understanding that the Father has released upon them because he understands where they are in their growth and so he's dealing with them on a certain level but just because one person may not have a same conviction during the same time as another individual does not mean that a gray area exists it just means the father has not dealt with them in that manner yet because he is the author and the finisher of their faith he is the one that is leading and guiding them and teaching them because he understands where they are in their growth and development he knows his children better than those who are around him so he is the best one that can place things upon their hearts and lead them and guide them into all truth, into all righteousness and different things like that. But what Satan does is he'll come in and he'll love to try to produce that aspect of saying like that's, that, it, that a gray area exists. And the reason why Satan wants to put this gray area out there is because if you receive a conviction but you decide not to yield to it, then it gives you something to fall back on to nullify, I think I'm saying that word correctly, to nullify the conviction that is on your heart. If this is making sense. So these gray areas that Satan allows to be perpetuated, which do not exist in Scripture, are typically areas where he's blurring the lines of God's holiness and, and the standard which he has set before us. And he's also blurring these points of, like these are points of compromise where we're compromising, in so many words, we're compromising with our flesh or we're compromising with the enemy. Like these, these great areas that we see that tend to emerge in discussions around the gospel and uh, of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom and different things like this are these areas where the Bible speaks very plain, but because people have a dissatisfaction with the truth of what the scriptures say, they have to try to find a way to make it say what it's not saying, and that's what results in a gray area. And it's a gray area because the Bible is black and white, but when you read the Bible, you can't, you know what I'm saying, because it's so black and white, the only way you can make it say what it's not saying is to create a gray area. And this gray area, you can say, well, the Bible isn't that clear on that subject. Or the Bible isn't that clear on this aspect right here. Right? And these gray areas are Satan's playground. He loves this gray because it's, it's, it's where he operates the best. It's where he creates confusion. It's where he creates division. It's where he compromises the standard of the Most High God of Israel. And it's how he conceals his movement. Right. And this is where you start to see a whole bunch of denominations and different things like that and division in the body of Christ, because in truth, we're supposed to be non-denominational. We're not supposed to be divided. There is a doctrine and there's a faith system and a gospel that has been released in the earth. Right. Faith in Christ and a gospel of the kingdom, which Christ himself talked about often. Right. But because of certain distortions in faith and what the, the how the church functions and, and the reality of Scripture, these gray areas have emerged and Satan has used that to create all kinds of division where we begin to idolize different aspects of truth and create separate entities within the body that lead to confusion because now we're arguing about what's the right way and what's the wrong way and different things like that, right? But that's these great areas that, that Satan loves and that's why he loves them, right? It keeps us divided and the more we keep, the more we are divided and focusing on ourselves, we're not paying attention to him. That's why it says what it says right here is like it conceals his movement. It's like a smoke screen. It's, it's like it's like in a firefight. If you throw a smoke grenade, right? Once the smoke billows up, you can you have a, a a greater freedom of movement because they can't see you. 
right? The enemy can't see you. So he creates this gray, this little smoky areas, these smoking mirrors. So we're looking at ourselves and we're looking at each other, but we're not looking at him and we don't understand how he's moving in. We don't even see that he's the one that's moving in there, right? All right, so this aspect of the original church, it traces all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? So we know Adam and Eve was the foundation, right? And then we see as we progress through the scriptures, you go to Enoch, then Noah, then Abram, then you got Isaac and you got Jacob, who is Israel. And then you get to this aspect where there's now Israel and Gentile. All right, so some key verses here, um, Hebrews chapter 11, it's just a, that's a point of reference to go back and study, but this is where this, the scriptures basically kind of map out the, the concept of faith, and it kind of starts to list everyone out and help us kind of map the evolution of the body of Christ and, and, and what the Father deems as his church over the time throughout the scriptures, right? But in um, this aspect of Acts chapter 10, verses 20 and through 29, which is highlighted, helps us to understand where the church is right now, right? And I know, I know you might be wondering, like, what has any of this to do with the, the black church and different things like that? I promise we get in there. I'm just, I'm laying all of this in the background so that when we get where we're going, everything makes sense, right? Because you got to see the patterns of how Satan operates because he, again, he does the same cycles. And different things like that. So he, he does the same cycle of approach. He has the same intention and the same goal with these different things that he does. And, and that's what we need to see, right? So Acts chapter 10, verse 28 through 29, it says, Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them, For what reason have you sent me? Right? So in Acts chapter 10, what Peter is telling these individuals that he came to, like this is, this, is, this is the true understanding of what is going on in Acts chapter 10. When Peter had the vision, right, he said he, they were fasting and he fell into a trance and he had this vision three times where these, these sheets with four corners came down to him with all type of unclean animals on it. And the father had told him in his vision, you know, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter was like, Lord, I would never eat anything unclean. And he said, don't call anything don't call what i have clean unclean right so just a quick sidebar a lot of people look at that verse and they always take that verse to talk about food and different things like that some versions even insert it in parentheses they're saying like you know certain things were shared and stuff like that as far as like what it's okay to eat and different things like that but the reality is this verse had nothing to do with food right in the trance the most High had given peter a vision so that way it would catch his attention enough and he would make it, he, he would, it would catch his attention in a way where what the father was trying to communicate to him, he would be curious enough to say, this was such a significant thing I've just seen. What does it mean? Right. And if you don't believe me, you go back and read the entire chapter of Acts chapter 10 in context and the verses interpret themselves. Right. While Peter, it, the scriptures literally say while Peter was pondering on what the vision means. Or what it meant, right? These three men came to his door, right? And then Peter knew once those three men came to his door, it's like he received understanding. And then when you get to Acts chapter 10, verse 28 through 29, 29, he says it like 28 and 29. He explains the interpretation that he received when those men came to his door, like the understanding was released unto him. He said, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean, right? Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for, right? So what it is, is while he was pondering about, like, Lord, what does this mean? Then these men came to his door, and the Holy Spirit released understanding to him. And because he knew it was what the Father was telling him, dealing with these people that were outside of Israel, right? Then he said, without hesitation, he yielded to what the Father was telling him, and he went. If this is making sense. This is significant because prior to Acts chapter 10, the gospel was only being preached throughout Israel and to those who were descendants of Israel right and it's Acts chapter 10 where you start to see that that's what had shifted and the gospel was released unto the Gentile nations as well in fulfillment of the prophecy where the father said I will provoke them to jealousy with the people who are not my people right so all of this is significant because we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing the evolution of the church, right? And the reasons why it's important to understand the evolution of the church 
It's because we have to understand how it all ties in together and how it fits together and how it all fits with prophecy, right? Because all of this stuff is connected to what we're talking about today. All right, so understanding this aspect of the original church, right? We have to understand what this engrafted concept of the church means, right? So the gospel of the kingdom for all nations. So before Christ ascended, he had told the disciples, it's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He said that Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, right? So before Acts chapter 10 occurred, we see Christ had left them with this great commission. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations, right? All the nations and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Right. So this is where we start to understand this concept of this engrafting into the original church. Right. This is why it's important to understand what was delivered to Israel and also to understand how the gospel of this kingdom, the gospel of Christ was extended to those who were not Israelites, but were of Gentile descent. Because the Bible talks about how. Because of the rebellion of, 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 of God's chosen people, the Jews, right? Like this is what it became to be a blessing to the earth because now we, by faith in Christ, those who are outside of Israel can come and have relationship and be adopted as sons and daughters into what was once only for Israel, if this is making sense. So now that the gospel of Christ is here and it's been preached and it's been released unto all people, right? We see that there is an engrafting which has occurred so that by faith in Christ, those who are outside of Israel now become a part of Israel by faith in Christ. And they begin to yield to what is being taught and what has been commanded through the, the very words of Christ himself. Right. So this is what we see in Acts chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. And this Jerusalem council. Right. So Acts chapter 15, verses 18 through 21 is, is where we see two things happening. We see the extension of grace, right, to allow that room for growth for those who are converting into faith in Christ and receiving that the gospel of the kingdom who had never known Christ or who are, who are outside of, of, of Israel and didn't understand the culture. And we also see this explanation of what it means to be engrafted into the body of Christ, right? So Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 18 and going through 21, it says, Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we shall not trouble the, those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Right. So what was what was happening here is they were having a debate as far as like, how do we deal with these Gentiles who are coming to faith in Christ? Right. What do we do? Do we just come and do we teach them all about the law and everything like that? Like, how do we approach the situation? Because we understand what's going on because we were raised in this. This is our culture. Right. That's the equivalent of saying, like, I was born and raised in the church. Right. Like we were this like. This Bible that they're going to be reading or, or these, this, what they're going to be reading from as history and as like, like a, a faith book or whatever is our history and it's our culture. Right. So so what they were saying is like because this is our culture and this is everything to do with our genealogy and everything like that. Right. Like we understand a lot of this stuff. And so we're living differently than they are. So what do we do and how do we approach this concept of these individuals coming to our faith? And being engrafted in, like, what what does that look like for them, right? And the Holy Spirit gave them wisdom, and this is what was said. Don't trouble them who are turning, but write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, sexual morality, and things strangled with blood, right? Some of the main things that they were, like, the most known for as far as within their sin and, and their culture from, like, their pagan worship and their, their demonic ideologies and, and idol worship and different things like that is the main things that the Holy Spirit through these brothers said, like, this is the main stuff we should tell them to abstain from for right now. And why is this the main thing that we should tell them to abstain from? Because in verse 21, for, the, for, for Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So what they were saying is, 
Give them these basic foundations and these basic principles, these things which will put them at odds with the most high. Like the most significantly, because we understand that every week when they come to the, the when they come to the temple, as is our custom, the same way it was as Christ's custom, right? They're gonna hear the law of the prophets, right? They're gonna hear the history, they're gonna hear Everything that we've been hearing that we was raised in since our youth, they're going to hear it as they come. And the more they hear it, the more they can grow and understand and apply it. Right. But it was this aspect and this concept that showed us what this engrafting was. Right. So those who were already Jews, they had a lot of the culture and the customs. It was because they it was just that was just their that was just them. Right. So they had to add faith in Christ. On the contrary, when you had Gentiles who are outside of that culture, not only did they have to have faith in Christ. But now as they were coming to learn of what the scriptures said as far as like how they should live, what was acceptable and unacceptable and different things like that. It was a growth process because it was things that were foreign to them, yet they had never, that they were not uh, fully aware of, if this is making sense, right? So this is significant because we have to understand what it means as far as this engrafting process and what that actually looks like. Because by understanding this, then we can understand what Satan's counterattack to that is. Right, because Satan never allows. There, there's nothing that the Father is doing that Satan is not going to move against. There's nothing that he's not going to counterattack. Right, and this is important because when we think about a contemporary gospel, or we think about contemporary churches and different things like that, I guarantee you we're gonna we're gonna look at it through the lens of what, of of our generation, right, and what we understand time to be right now. But the reality is, is a contemporary gospel in this contemporary church was was existing way before our time. It was just known as something different, right? This is where you start to see like Greek Hellenism and different things like that, where there were cultural things and there were there were faith-based things of the scriptures that were being perverted by these more quote-unquote enlightened or educated civilizations, where they would come in and they would see the practices of the Bible and they would see the faith of these people and they would say, well, you know what, that's beautiful and all, but, you know, this wisdom that we have, yeah, we, we have to trust this wisdom. And, and, and you start to see this infusion of a lot of different philosophies and ideologies that were contrary to Scripture back then, which was causing people to stray from certain foundation biblical truths of the Scriptures. Right? And so this is where you see some of the rebellions and everything like that amongst the early church and, and uh, amongst the, Jew, the, the Jewish cultures and different things like that. Because what was happening is it's like they were like, hey. Like there's a there's a way we're supposed to be living, but you guys are being influenced by these these nations around us, and you're not living how we're supposed to. So you start to see these revolts and these rebels because like there was there was compromise and there were great areas being created and different things like that. That's not only in in, in like the Hellenistic um, Jewish era, but that's also all throughout Scripture. Anytime you see the Father judging His people, He's looking like, look, y'all keep doing stuff I'm telling y'all not to do, and you need to stop it, right? So. That's the aspect of how, like, we see this contemporary message, like, throughout the scriptures consistently, but we have to understand that it was always been there so we can understand how to see it now, right? Because the Father's initial desire for us was that, like, his, his, his people that knew his ways, right, were supposed to be the ones who were teaching those who did not know his ways, all right. So if, if anyone has a question as far as, well, why was the gospel only being taught amongst the Hebrews and everything until like Acts chapter 10? The, the reason for that being was is because the law of God was given to Israel and it was entrusted to their care. And so they understood certain things that the rest of the world did not know because the law was given as a sign, like there's certain things that was given to bear witness and, and testify of the Most High God, right? It was something to distinguish his people and identify them with this holy God that was different from all of the gods of the other nations, right? So because they had this ongoing relationship with this God, which is the one true living God, right? And now they have faith in Christ, who was the fulfillment of these prophecies and these different scriptures that they were waiting on. They had to be on the same page because the the mantle that was on them, because Israel was 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 God's first, right? Like that was his firstborn, right? Christ was his only begotten son, but the scriptures highlight how Israel was God's firstborn, right? They were like the big brothers 
of those Gentiles who were going to be converted into the faith. So the father had to get them right first because the big brother always teaches the little brother. The big sister always teaches the little sister. And so what happens is, like, there was supposed to be, hey, you know the standards because you're older, right? Like, you were raised in this. You know, you know, you know how I am as a father. You know, you know me. So as they're coming to have an understanding and place their faith in the Messiah, as you have, I need you to teach them who I am. But what Satan did was Satan saw that, and, and, and it was like that for a while, but Satan was working really hard to reverse that. Because Satan is always trying to reverse and invert what the Father is doing because it creates confusion. So where the people of the Bible who have faith in Christ were supposed to be teaching the earth, Satan's agenda was to come in and invert that and put it in a position where those who received of the Father and were supposed to be teaching now were sitting down and being taught by those who did not fully know and understand and appreciate the weight in a, in, in, uh, the weight of who the Most High God was. This is where you start to see this concept of the contemporary gospel. And this is where you start to see the, 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 uh, the antichrist spirit that Paul warned about. Right? This is where you start to see the spirit of lawlessness being released into the earth and different things like that. Right? But, but you can't understand how Satan moves as far as a counterattack against these aspects if you don't understand these foundational principles. Right? But the whole thing is the firstborn was supposed to have grace with the younger brother. Right? And, and the reason why you have to extend that grace is because, one, the father is very gracious to his people. All the times they fell short. So he was like, y'all don't need to be puffed up in pride. Y'all need to have grace because, like, you know what I'm saying? Every time I sent prophets to y'all and, and, and apostles, like, y'all would kill them. Right? Like, the very apostles that, that, we, that we learned about were, were murdered. Right? Or martyred. And different things along those lines. So, like, there's no point to be puffed up in pride against them because you feel like you know more. Because it's only by the grace of the Most High that you have the understanding you do. Right. So it comes back down to have the same grace for them as they're growing up into the faith because they are grafted in and they are not of the original root. If this is making sense. Right. So how does why is this all this matter and how does it get to where we're going now? Right. So this early church, some key things we have to understand about this. Right. So for the first 300 years. Right. You're talking about from the time that Christ started his ministry was 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 brutally crucified for all of our sakes and the sakes of those who will believe in him right the early church consisted of two and of, of, of two types of people like yeah you got a lot of different sects out there like s-e-c-t-s -E like a lot of different sects of faith and stuff out there that was that was circulating amongst the early church and different things like that we're not going to get out into all of that in this lesson but the primary two categories of believers in christ that you will see in the first in the first 300 years of, of the body of christ is you had Jews, right? You had Hebrews who had faith in Christ. And then you had what were known as Jewish Christians, right? Because they were not known as Christians until Antioch. That's the first term. That's the first time the term was given. And all that meant was Christ-like, right? So you had Hebrews who had faith in Christ, right? And then you had individuals who were known as Jewish Christians. They were known as Jewish Christians. And what this and this aspect of being a Jewish Christian was what we just read in Acts chapter 15. These were Gentiles who were not Israel by blood, but because they placed their faith in Christ, right? Because they had their faith in our Savior, they received the adoption of sons and were engrafted in. And so as they had their faith in Christ, they began to learn and study the ways of the Bible. And that caused others who were outside of our faith to start to identify them as Jewish Christians. Right. Because they knew that they weren't they knew that they weren't uh, Jews by blood, if that makes sense. So the, the, the way that they were described with other, by those around them were like Jewish Christians. They knew that they were non Hebrews. To have faith in Christ, but they lived according to how the Jewish culture was living, right? And that's for the first 300 years, talking about 
feast day, Sabbaths, and all of that, right? But this is what, that is something significant to understand because it helps us understand the history of the original church. We have to understand that because I'm telling you this now, for 300 years, that's what it was. And, it, and we cannot just come and just say, okay, well, after 300 years, like the father came and changed all of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, it's very significant that it lasted. Like, you're talking about persecutions. Like, this is a time when the church was persecuted heavily. Both Jews and Jewish Christians, right? Like, these Gentile com converts that were all grafted in, like, there was heavy persecution during these years, but they still persevered throughout all of that. Through three, for 300 years, right? They, they endured persecutions. They fled throughout Asia and all these different places. They fled throughout Africa and all of these other places. Like, they were being persecuted, but still ministering the gospel, still setting up their temples, still doing the work of the kingdom, even though they were dying and being slaughtered and stuff like that for 300 years, right? And that was problematic. So this is so this is how Constantine begins to play a role in this, and and I, I pray to God, I pray that everyone is following, because this is significant once we start to see what happened in America as well. All right, so Constantine played a key role in this in this in this in this instance, right? The biggest lie about Constantine is that he was a Christian, right? Constantine was not a Christian. If you go and study hard enough, you'll see he was not a Christian. Right. He claimed Christ, but his whole purpose for even claiming Christ or, or that he co converted it to be a Christian was it was a political move. Right. The reason why he chose to use Christianity. To quote unquote convert into is because it was the easiest for him to infuse with this aspect of the Roman imperial cult, which taught about divine rule. This aspect about divine rule, if you know, if you're not familiar with it, this is what we see. And other faith systems throughout the earth. This is what we see in Egypt where they say that pharaohs were our gods, right? It's this aspect of you should yield to me because I am divinely appointed as a god or by a god to rule you as people. It's similar to this aspect of manifest destiny and different things like that, right? So because Christianity had aspects of it, right? Faith in the Bible had aspects about this, 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 this aspect of like divine leadership, because we all know about the story of King David, we know about King Saul and Solomon, because the Bible had historical texts about the father himself raising up kings and those to rule his people, though that was not his original intent, right? We see that he, he told Samuel, like, they ain't rejected you, they rejected me. This is the king I'll give them. And that's where we start seeing kings emerge, right? They were not supposed to be like those around the world, right? But because Constantine saw this in the Bible, he saw this in the scripture, he said that this is like he understood that this was the easiest faith system that he could connect with that would allow him to still push his agenda and advance his political desires and still stay true to who he really was without compromising the faith that he originally held. Right. So how did Constantine do this? One, Constantine's political goal was to unify the peoples, right? Because we know Rome was an expansive empire. We know that they had, they had, they were all over all of these different continents, and they were constantly trying to, uh, trying to maintain peace and order. Like they were just an expansive global empire, right? So Constantine's goal was to unify the people. So what did he do? He converted to Christianity, quote unquote, and then he, he, what, it, what's the term I'm looking for? He made it illegal to persecute. Christians, right? What's significant about that that a lot of people overlook is he didn't just make it illegal to persecute Christians. He, he instituted a concept of religious freedom that applied to not only Christians, but to all faith systems, if this makes sense. And that's important because a lot of people will stand on the fact that, oh, well, Constantine, you know, he, uh, Constantine shifted this and he shifted that and you know, he did all of this for the body of Christ But there's some aspects of it that a lot of people don't really know that Constantine had going on, right? So he absolved like all persecution and, and created this religious freedom so that way everyone would be free to worship whoever they wanted Whatever faith system they wanted to practice they could like this because he was trying to unify the people, right? Through all of this he still maintained certain pagan aspects of his faith and one of his ultimate political ag uh, agendas was to create this, this culture of coexistence 
amongst these different faith systems. That's why he, he made it legal for everyone to practice this aspect of freedom of religion. So they can begin so they could become united as one people. All of these different cultures, he wanted them to be united as one. And he gave them this freedom of religion because he understood that some of the biggest divides and cultural rifts that were experienced were because of these faiths and these conflicts over faith. So he's like, look, y'all can do whatever y'all want to do. We're going to unite together. And ultimately, his goal was to begin to marry all of these faith systems together into one faith system, into one religion. So he wanted all of these people to be united as one. And he wanted all of these faith systems to ultimately be united as one. But this is the significance with that, right? Not only did Rome have its own pagan deities that it worshipped, a lot of the cultures that they con that they conquered had a lot of pagan deities that they worshipped and that they were infused with in different things that were not that the Bible specifically forbade. Right? So this contemporary gospel that existed with Constantine was not only like like he used his platform to begin to 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 mitigate this exclusive aspect of the Bible to make it more inclusive. Right. So because Constantine was this great leader and this great emperor and he had, quote unquote, converted to Christianity, he was given a certain a, lot, a, a level of influence and authority in the church. And this is where he began infusing paganism within the body, within the practice of the faith of the Bible. The very thing that the Bible itself said not to do, he infused it in there because it was one of those. It was it was it was deemed uh, it was deemed as separatists or exclusive and counterproductive to his goal of creating an environment that was coexistent and uh, uh, you, you get what I'm trying to say, right? So he infused pagan worship practices. That's where you see him creating this veneration of the Sunday of Sunday as holy. That's where you start to see him venerating like Christmas and this aspect of like the nativity of Christ and different things like that because these practices were things that were big in these other cultures that idolized these different deities. And so he infused it so that way it was easier for everyone to maintain their own aspects, but still, like, they could profess faith in Christ or whatever they were going to do, but still maintain their original state of being, if this is making sense. This is why in a lot of, like, the Roman Catholic Church, you see all these veneration of all of these, uh, these deities, what they call them saints, like saint such and such, saint such and such. If you do a deep study on these different saints, they're all connected to a different demonic entity somewhere in a different faith system but they call it a saint such and such from the bible so that way they can mask what's really going on right so we understand this and then constantine also began to attack certain congregations though he allowed he he said he was doing like a freedom of religion he was opposed to those religions that were deemed as exclusive as far within the body of christ so these were like the Jew, Jew, uh, they called them Judaizers. So these Jewish Christians and Jews that were not conforming to the the new things that he was instituted, they were often excommunicated and they were still persecuted, right? Um, if there was any congregations that were big on holiness, they were often opposed, and uh, they had these they they had a term. Like I said, I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but they had individuals that were supported by by Constantine and this new faith system he was implementing where. The individuals that were selling out and compromising and, and giving up, the, like, during these times of persecution where they were looking for these underground churches and stuff, these individuals who were selling out their brethren and giving up names and turning over holy relics and stuff like that were often the ones who were put in position to lead over the church in the area that they just sold out the brethren who were still holding on to the true faith and things like that, right? So after all of that going on, it began to undo what had been held for the last 300 years. And that's where you start to see the Nicene Council and all these different things, which led to the institution of doctrines and faith practices and what is known as acceptable and unacceptable in the body of Christ to this day. Right. It was a contemporary gospel. All right. So history repeats itself. That's why it's important to know all of that so we can get where we're going. So the Roman church has always been antichrist. It's important to understand that the system of worship has been infused throughout the West. All throughout West, Western philosophy, especially in churches, right? The structure and doctrine of Constantine has been spread through adherence to church structures that fall in allegiance with the Roman papacy, either knowingly or unknowingly, right? So a lot of individuals don't understand that a lot of the structures we see in our society today when it comes to faith is directly connected back to what happened right around 325 AD, right? So you're talking about 1700 years ago. 
there was a shift from what the true church was to where it is now. All right. So moving forward, we see this. We see this is occurring. And this is where we start to get to this aspect of how that same spirit attacked the black churches and the doctrine within our communities. Right. So how did that contemporary gospel that we see way back in 300 A.D. resurface here in the Americas within the black churches within the American institution? Right. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. We have to understand that initially during slavery, there were certain constraints that that existed, which limited what slaves could teach and learn and understand about the Bible, right? But it also created limitations as far as like what type of stuff they could indulge in. So what this means is be, by the very deep, uh, nature of being enslaved as people, there were certain aspects of the Bible that we, that that a lot of believers practice and indulge in today that slaves would not have even cared to indulge in, right? So when all of this materialism, all of this like uh, being super tolerant and not like all of this stuff that we argue about that's like really like has nothing to do with anything and it's all vain today, slaves were not concerned with that because their life was so much more difficult. They were living in bondage. So what they really stood on and pulled from was the core foundational principles of the scriptures that they had understood from what they were taught and also from what they understood, right? So what do I mean from what they understand? One biggest myth that is a pet peeve of mine is that slavery was the white man's religion, right? A fact is this. Many slaves that arrived in Americas were a mixture of Jews, Jewish, Christian, Christian, Muslim, and other African faith traditions like voodoo, hoodoo, Yoruba, and a lot more, right? So a lot of slaves that came over here, a lot of people don't understand that, like, the, the, the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom was already in Africa, right? It was in Africa before Islam was there. Islam arrived in Africa around the 500 and 600, and they came by conquest, right? So we always focus a lot on the fact that they say Christianity came by conquest, but the reality is, is Islam came by conquest too, right? It was a forced conversion. It was either you convert or you die, right? So that's why people will say, oh, well, Islam was there before Christianity and different things like that. But people who say that have never read Acts, and they forget about the Ethiopian eunuch, right? The Ethiopian eunuch was a Jew, and he was coming to Jerusalem to worship. Only Hebrews came to Jerusalem to worship because Acts 10 had not occurred yet, right? The gospel had not been released to Gentiles. And they had not even begun to be, I don't want to get too deep into that, right? But on his way to worship, he encountered one of the apostles who preached the gospel of Christ to him. And my man was baptized, went to celebrate, and still went home. He went back to Ethiopia, right? This is within the first century. So that means that the gospel of Christ was taken back to the Jews who were in Africa, right? And not only was it taken back to the Jews who were already in Africa, right? They also had the same mantle, and they also were filled with the same Holy Ghost that compelled Peter to preach and receive that boldness. So you think they just went back to Africa and just sat still and did nothing with it for the next thousand years? No, the Holy Spirit probably was on them brothers and sisters strong. And, we, and, and, and they probably was out there doing the work of the kingdom and doing the work that the Holy Spirit is going gonna, is gonna to empower you to do by nature of who you are, right? So the gospel of the Christ and, uh, of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom was all throughout Africa, right? But you also understand that there were Muslims that were there and there were also different, like a lot of different faith traditions from the, uh, the African tribes and stuff that was already there as well. But that's significant because if this is the case, that means that everyone who came over as slaves was connected to some different way, like into like these different faith systems and stuff like that. And that's significant and that's important, right? So these stories and these things that were passed down, right, are, are things that were allowed to, this is what strengthened their faith in the black community over here, even through slavery. You had the, the, the slaves who were Muslims, who held on to their Muslim, their Islamic traditions to keep them through. And those who were these different um, hoodoo and voodoo and different other faith traditions, like they held on that stuff to get them through. But these individuals who came over here who have faith in Christ, they held on to what they understood and the stories that were passed down about Christ to get them through, right? And that's significant because it understand it helps us see the foundation of why the, the, the black church in America was so strong, right? So black churches initially weren't infused with a lot of the stuff we see today, right? There was a strong sense of holiness and perseverance just by nature of, of the plight of slavery, right? And a key aspect to understand with all of this is that because of all of this, 
black churches were essential to our communities and faith was essential to just about every aspect of our life. And this is the things that led to our progression, right? So as we continue to grow in our faith in Christ and stand on Christ, regardless of our situation in slavery, we start to see the hand of the Most High move again, right? We start to see the Underground Railroad. We start to see these little uprisings here and there. We start to see um, those who are oppressing us partner with us in order to help individuals escape and different things like that. And ultimately, you see the Civil War happen, and the Civil War was not initially about slavery, but somehow slavery was attached to it, right, by the grace of the Father. And you see the Emancipation Proclamation, right? So you see this, this undoing of, of the physical bondage of slavery. Though we see Jim Crow and all this other stuff start to emerge, you got to understand and see how the Father's moving through all of this as our faith continues to grow in different things like this, right? So moving forward, moving forward, there was a shift that occurred in the civil rights era, right? Before I hit on this, I want I want to I want to I want to hit on this really quick, and then um, because we have a few more slides, because I don't want to take up too much more time, right? But what has to be understood is this: one reason why the civil rights, the the church was so central in the in the black community, is because of the oppression that we faced. There was there was nothing else. Right. And, and what needs to un and what we need to understand is this. We did not have access to the luxury that a lot of communities had in. in um, we didn't have the black community did not have access to the same things that Caucasian communities had. Right. White communities had. This is why the church was so important and foundational. Right. And this is this kind of connects a little bit to what we talked about last week. And this is an understanding that is void in a lot of the younger generation today, which is why there's so much rebellion against how things work, because they don't understand, right? The The reason why the church was so central is because it was our community center. It was our, uh, it was our, our meeting spaces. It was our wedding spaces. It was our space for funerals. It was like birthday parties, like everything you could think of, like that was our safe space. Because outside of our community, we didn't have access to like a whole bunch of event centers and all of this other stuff. Like segregation was still going on. We were still getting lynched. You might get hung just because you're walking home too late from work. And somebody said, you know what? I feel like going to hang somebody. Right? So like, like these churches became everything to our community because not only were they our safe space where we gathered and we fellowshiped with one another, but it's also where we drew our strength and related with our and, and related with our creator, right? Our faith in Christ. It's where we positioned to the most high. And during the civil rights movement, that's where we were doing our meetings and all of this other stuff, right? So like it became very central because this is this was the foundation of our communities and, and this is what our communities were structured on. If this makes sense. This has to be understood because this parallels the first few hundred years. Remember how we talked about like all of the persecution and the stuff that was happening, but they still maintain the faith, right? The civil rights era, there was a shift, right? So the, the church was our foundation in our communities, right? And, and when I say church, I need you to understand I'm talking about the building, but how we understand church to be today is different when it was then, right? Because like if you were connected with the church, like it's because of your, where your faith was at. Right. It wasn't just an empty building and just something people did at the time. It was like that was essential to everything. Right. So what happened during the civil rights movement that led to the shift is there was a lot of piggyback movements, which saw the momentum of the civil rights movement within the black community because the father was with us. And these piggyback movements brought a lot of strange ideas, theologies and distractions to our community. Right. There's a lot of things that were being becoming uh, that were being imposed on our community that as problems, which were not problems, but they had to be imposed on our community because otherwise we wouldn't have these. They wouldn't have been able to attach and, ca and cause us to to sympathize with them, to let them join the movement that we had within our community. Right. So with these piggyback movements, this concept about strange ideas, theologies and, and distractions being um, and, uh, uh, and distractions being attached to our community. And these different doctrines emerging and stuff like that. What we have to understand is the church was central to our community. So in order for these, and the church was the foundation of a lot of things we were doing. Right? 
So in order for these movements to attach itself to our movements, they had to attach themselves and find a way to infiltrate the churches, right? But the infusion of all of these strange ideas, theologies, and distractions led to a decline in the church participation, all right? So the reason, and I'll just, I'll just throw this quick nugget out there, the reason why there's so much controversy and discussion about now, like if you don't show up at church, the older generation automatically assumes that you're sinning and stuff like that, is because back then, like church, because church was so central, if you started declining in your church participation, back then it typically was a very strong indicator that you were walking away from the faith and getting involved in stuff that you were not supposed to. Today, that may not be the case, but then it was. So that's why as we shifted over time, the younger generation didn't understand why if they didn't come to church, the older, the elders in the church were looking like, what you been up to? because of their cultural experience with the church and, and, and all of the stuff that they've seen but maybe never talked about, they saw that that was typically the start of someone leaving the faith, if that makes sense, right? And once we see this decline of church participation and this loss of true faith, right, because a lot of people still identify as Christians and stuff like that, right, you start to see a, st a surge in statistics, right? So just about every negative statistic we see in our community, we start to see it surging. So every negative statistic you see about the black community, when we started to step away from our faith in the Most High God of Israel, you start to see the statistics surge, right? And let's just keep moving, right? So this is this is the concept that I was talking about, this church infiltration, right? So these these new ideologies and philosophies were introduced, and that's where you start to see all of this stuff about like this, uh, all of this, what was it like, this, this old form of New Age mysticism where you see like all of these, uh, the psychedelic era, all of this hippie stuff and like all of this philosophy and atheism, like there's so many different things that were brought into the, the, the doctrine of the black church that didn't exist, right? Because the black church was on holiness. Hey, look, look, we like, we, we here for Christ and this is some of the stuff we're doing. Yeah, they had different cultural traditions and different things that were there because like that was just a community, but like the foundation of, of, of Christ was strong, right? And I'm not talking about the hypocrites and stuff. Like, there's, there's hypocrites in every generation, right? Paul even talked about it back then. Like, he's like, I had to withstand these hypocrites to their faith. And he talked about those who were supposed to be of the faith but had departed from the faith. And he called them out in Scripture and stuff like that. So I don't want us to get too caught on it and be like, well, in the, there was always stuff going on in the black church and stuff. The reality is, it's like, it was a strong stance on holiness, regardless right but before all these different denominations came like it was strong stance on like look this is christ this is the gospel this is how we live in right there was structure there was order and like that is is what led to us to walk into the blessings that the father had promised in his scriptures on our communities that's where you start to see that progression that elevation satan brought this contemporary gospel of inclusion which started to diminish that aspect the same way it happened before with constantine did the same antichrist spirit which was infused in Western churches, came and began to infuse itself with the black church, which was separate from the Western churches. Why was the black congregation separate from the Western churches? Well, because of slavery and segregation. And, and I'm not going to get into the aspect about like what well, it was like, like Southern Baptist conventions and Southern Baptist churches that were white and they had like strong stances. The doctrine of, of once saved, always saved came from Southern Baptist church congregations who were embedded with who were full of Ku Klux Klan members because they had to find a way to say that they were still going to receive salvation though they were out here raping and lynching and killing black men, women, and children because of their bigotry, right? So, so outside of denominations and everything, what, what I'm trying to highlight is because of all of this separation in our culture and our society here in America, the black church maintained a certain uh, solidarity and set, set apartness from the other cultures, right? But once the civil rights era happened and there was like a, the desegregation aspect and all these new ideologies and stuff had began to, began to be infused in, what we now see is this concept of the, the Antichrist spirit that was over this Roman theology started to attach themselves and be brought into the black church, right? So we start to see disruption in the orders that was, was within the body of Christ, right? We start to see a lot of concepts that detract from the truth of scripture being here, you start seeing these puppets emerge, right? And these puppets that emerge are uh, going to do your research on it, but it's something called the Bulls, Bully Society, right? And uh, you also see this, you start to see an influence with these Masonic lodges and different things like that. But this aspect is like these puppets began to be emerged and placed within different communities, 
right? The same way we just talked about how Roman Catholic, uh, how 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 Constantine did it then, right? It's it's wild, man. When you look at how the spirit operates like that, but this attack on holiness and the, and the true structure and the core of this 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 faith system that was guarded by the Most High and was genuine in faith towards the the Most High God of Israel, right? Once these these key leaders started being knocked out of position. Once the church started being broken down and you start to see all of this, this corruption started to infiltrate, right? These puppets started being put up. Those who were basically selling out, that's where the term sellout comes from, right? These individuals who are basically selling one another out and doing all these different things and being bought with money, being paid, right? Like for these different things were being put in positions to carry this, this, this different doctrine that was not the same. And then you start to see all of this division occur, right? Where you see all of these different denominations and and denomination is just it just it just there's different definitions for denomination, but you gotta understand how denominator and numerators work. A denominator is a division, right? So it's carnality, like these different sects and stuff like that that exists. It says like it isn't sectar uh, sectarianism is carnality. That's what the word of God says, right? So we see these denominations, which is sectarianism, but all of that stuff started happening because of all of these different theologies and philosophies and all this stuff was being broken down, right? And we started operating again outside the will of the Most High. And then we start seeing these different curses and stuff manifest in our communities again, right? On top of that, because of the, all this infighting and all this confusion and all this corruption that was happening, we failed to see how this community was shifting because of these newfound freedoms as a result of these civil rights movements. And we began to lose relevancy, not in the sense that Christ can become irrelevant, but in the sense that we were no longer speaking and ministering to and equipping our brothers and sisters in our community to exist and to maintain a certain understanding and walk with Christ, though the world around us was shifting. We were not preparing our individuals with the necessary knowledge for the era that they existed in, so that way they would not stray from the Father, if this is making sense. And this, again, if, if, if uh, this is where last week's lesson plays, like this... It, Go back and watch it if you didn't get to see it, right? So the result of all of this, you see broken homes, broken marriages, broken communities, drug abuse, domestic abuse, disproportionate incarceration, behavioral health and mental health disproportionalities, right? And a lot of times we say a lot of the mental health and behavioral health is because of uh, because we don't talk about certain issues in the black community. That stuff plays a role. But one of the biggest things is because of, of a lot of the things that began to become perpetuated because we stepped away from true faith in the Father, Right. It created it opened up the door for the enemy to come in and just destruct, destroy everything. And so what it is, is all of these broken homes, broken marriages, all of these results that we see are the 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 after effects of the traumatic experiences that have emerged because of the 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 full out of salt that's been opened up on the black church because of all of this stuff. Right. And and that's important. And And there's a reason why. Our churches were attacked, right? Like every time we stood strong, we continued to grow. We continued to grow, right? So the black church is savior, right? And we're getting down to these last two slides. And this aspect of this black church is savior is, is so now the black community was broken, right? We just look all of this, just we were broken, all right? We just we just beat down and broken. <laughs> all right. So this this stuff was thrown into our community. Our congregations received all of this false doctrine. And, and this is important to understand because this is the same tactic that the enemy is going to, that he's using on the whole earth right now to, to break everything so that way he can, so we, he can become the solution, right? So the contemporary gospel and these theologies came in and they broke our churches. And their, the mindset then became, well, because they're broken, now we have to help them. So all of these quote unquote saviors began to emerge for the black church. And this is where we see all of this exploitation start to happen. And like, like there were so many theories as far as like why, you know what I'm saying? Why, why, why our, our, our churches and our communities were how they were, right? People started looking, they, you know, people won't, they don't want you to say, they, they don't want you to look at any of it being having to do with anything that the concept of anything dealing with black Jews, right? But they are completely fine with you looking at the curse of Ham and just putting that on all the, the slave descendants, right? So so they'll they'll say, okay, well, curse of Ham applies 
to to African Americans, but they don't want you to see any of the curses or anything that was dealing with Israel or anything like that, right? But there's a reason for that. So, but this whole aspect is, it's because we're broken now. We see these things and says, okay, well now we need help. So we see all of these aspects that come out. Well, why are they broken? Well, they're stuck in their ways. They're just stuck in tradition. They don't know how to do this and they don't know how to do that. They're just ignorant. They need education. They need to go to seminary. They need to do all of these different. All of these theories began to emerge as far as why to say like why the black community and the churches were broken, right? We didn't know what to do, so we needed to be retaught, right? We we received instruction that was uh so be, because of all of these different aspects, we began receiving instruction that was counterproductive to our community and they weren't relevant to our culture. A lot of ravenous wolves came in. You see exploitation, false doctrine, and rebellion, right? So this is where you see a lot of our, uh, what's the word? Like, uh, this is where you start to see a lot of uh, white ministries and Caucasian ministries coming to the, to be the saving grace of black American churches. Right? We, we, we know what's going on, so here, let us help you. And the problem with that and, and, and the downside with that is it's the same thing that they that happens with the civil rights era and like all of these 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 oppressive systems that are being talked about now what's consistently talked about is this aspect here where it's like we're not going to come we're not going to ask you what we need we can from because we know so much we can look at you and tell what's wrong with you and we're going to be the solution that's that that's that fails that's never been effective any type of community development or anything that's never been effective. Black communities stay crippled because people come from the outside and say, this is what you need. And they start doing stuff that has nothing, that has no relevance whatsoever to anything we need to fix our communities. The same thing happened within our churches. They, they, they projected all of these problems on us. These problems and these ideologies and philosophies took away our faith in the most high God of Israel. It, it crippled our faith in Christ. It broke our churches. And because our churches broke and our relationship with the most high broke and we became rebellious and disobedient our communities and our homes and everything about us broke our school systems failed. like all of this stuff broke and then everybody came in and said after we were broken man it sucks that y'all like that let us come and help you but it's like no <laughs> you know what i'm saying i'm not saying that it's bad that we receive help what i'm saying is like the narrative that has been projected on the church is like you need help and the reason, and, and no one is ex explaining that the reason why we need help is because people came in to help us before when we didn't need any help. We just wanted rights. We like, look, just treat us like people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But all of these problems were projected on us. And after all those problems were projected on us, now all of these solutions are projected on us. And these solutions have, n they have no relevancy to our culture. And, and what I mean, and, I, and I'm praying that you follow what I'm saying with this, right? So they, they typically give us solutions that are not culturally relevant because it's relevant for other cultures. And it produces lawlessness, right? So the Bible says, so this is where we start to see a whole lot of confusion in our congregations now. The Bible says, like, spare, don't spare the, like, don't spare, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? But we have a culture that does not necessarily agree with uh, the rod, right, as the Bible says. And so they they begin to infuse, they begin to project that on us and like that like that just that's just a small example, but my reason for giving that example, Father, help me explain this right. The reason for giving that example is because there's there's ways of of operating in their community that is foreign to how we operate in our community, right? Because a lot of the stuff we do naturally aligns with the scriptures, and this is what is projected on us, right? So like different parenting styles and stuff like that. And the reason why that is important to understand, hear me when I say this. The reason why that is important is because that is this, like that's the root of some of the gospels that is being produced onto the black church, right? Like it's that's what produces rebellion. It's a distortion. It's uh, it's distorted cultural aspects, right? Which project the culture of the people into the Bible and not pulling out the culture of the Bible onto the people, right? So they project this this idea of fatherhood onto the Most High God that is foreign to what the Scripture says about the Father. The father said he chases those whom he loves, right? But there's this gospel that's being put in here trying to fix the black church that removes all of that. It removes accountability. It produces rebellion. It produces pride. It pr produces pharisaical self-righteousness of lawless behavior, which keeps us broken. And the reason why that's significant is because of the reality of, of, of who is in our congregations, right? 
because everyone that's descended from slaves is like we've already talked about. Not everyone is a part of is not a part of Israel. Right. We've already said like there's a lot of different faces that came over here on a slave trade. But what we can't negate is the fact that some of those individuals are within our community. Right. And so. It goes all the way back to what we talked about with Constantine. Right. I mean, uh, sorry, not Constantine, the early church, like the big brother was supposed to teach the little brother who was the Gentiles being engrafted in. But there was an inversion. So back then there was an inversion and the Gentiles began teaching things that were contrary to scripture to the people of the father, which continued to lead to this perpetual, this perpetual cycle of like oppression, chastisement and all of this stuff like that was already prophesied. And then you see the same thing here, where it's individuals who did not receive the law or who, who, who were grafted in were trying to bring doctrines and to teach aspects of the scriptures in a way that was counterproductive because... I, man, we got to do a whole lesson on that, but it's, it's, it's backwards. That's all I'm saying. It's backwards. And, and, and the example I have with that, and I'll say this example, and I get to this last slide and I'll wrap it up, is, is my son. My older son is, is, is supposed to be the example. Right? He understands certain things. He knows certain things. He, he's very intelligent. He understands, like, the rules and different things, like, to the best of his ability. And, and he's supposed to... Be the example for the younger one that's coming behind him. But often because he sees the younger one doing certain things and he feels like that's what gets him attention. Right. He starts to do it, not understanding that the, un the younger one is like he's a baby. So he does like he doesn't know how to use his words. Right. So what gets attention for the younger one, because that's how he communicates. Right. The, like the baby brother, like that's how he communicates. The older one will start to mimic what he sees the younger one doing. The difference is the older one, because he knows better, it gets some attention, but it gets him the wrong kind of attention. Because it's an aspect where it's like, what are you doing? You know better. Well, stop doing what you see him doing. He's only doing that because he doesn't know any better. You're supposed to be teaching him and, and he's supposed to be following you. And you're supposed to be helping him understand how this thing works. But you're following him. Right. And you're looking at like, why is he, and he getting in trouble? It's because like he doesn't understand what you understand. Right? So the correction comes to you because it's like, like you're, you're at a different level in the sense of like you're older and your understanding is different than his. Right now, when he matures, like y'all are both going to be to the same standard. But in the meantime, like that's what's going on. But I'm saying all that to say that's one reason why I say he inverts it, right? Because he's, the whole, his whole goal is to get you at odds with the Most High God. Right. His whole goal when he inverts that is to produce rebellion in you and rebellion in the communities, because the more we continue to rebel against our father and our creator, the more our communities will stay broken. If this is making sense. Right. So. Getting on to it, this is the danger of the contemporary gospel today. Right. We see that. This this concept and these different lessons and philosophies and teachings and different things like that broke our communities, broke our churches. And what they did was they they it, this is the stuff that created those generational divides. Right. This is the stuff that that led to confusion. This is what led to abuse. This is what broke trust in the, in the congregation. Right. This is what broke trust in our communities. And and like there were just so many wrong things that were taught about our people in our community and our churches because of this stuff. That's contrary to history. It's, it's, it's like it opened the doors for other people to step in. And, and our communities are so receptive to it, especially right now, because they're like, man, like our churches have been broken for so long. Like maybe maybe they had it wrong back then. But hear me clearly, that is contrary to history. That is contrary to history. They couldn't have got it wrong because look how the more they grew and yielded to the father, and to faith in the, the God of the Bible, look at the elevation and the progression that happened. Though it though it took time, you know what I'm saying? Because we want everything to happen on our time. We the Father understands like the progression of things through time, so it's solidified and so it builds, right? Historically, we see that they were doing it the right way. That's what was elevating us. It's when all this stuff came in and broke all of that, like the wrong way. That so so we're bypassing what was the right way. And, and ignoring the standards of holiness and like how committed they were to the faith to, to faith in Christ, right? Uh, in in our in our older generations, what we are looking at is we're looking at, oh, they got it wrong, but we're only looking at like the last twenty years. 
when we're skipping and not looking at everything before then we're just looking at these last 20 30 40 years and looking like they got it wrong so it must all be wrong and this is what's opened us up to all of these different philosophies and this faith systems and like no one wants to deal anything with the scriptures anymore And because everyone feels like it was wrong, no one wants to return to it. But that's the very thing that we have to do because that is that is what was elevating us. And why is this important, right? What is what is the danger of this contemporary gospel? What is this danger of like trying to modernize, right? I'm not saying being relevant as far as like the time that you un that you're operating in and like being in season is wrong because the scripture tells us to be in season, right? There's a time and a place and all of that stuff, and it all Ecclesiastes breaks it down. What I'm explaining is this, this, this concept of like being more modern is typically used to propel, to project rebellion by saying that old way, that old stuff didn't work, right? There's a reason why Satan is constantly trying to say something about that old way. It happened in 300 and after like 300 years, the early church maintained solidarity. And then there became a, a, a there was a doctrine that was introduced that said, that's the old way of doing things that no longer works. We have to be more about this. We gotta we can't focus so much on holiness because it's too exclusive. You know, we gotta we gotta we gotta relax the standards so more people will come. But the the problem is you're not supposed to bring people to come so they stay the same. When they come, they receive faith and then they're trained in the in, in the faith. What are they being trained in? There's a culture of kingdom in this earth. What is what is the culture of the kingdom? It's not lawlessness and it's not rebellion. It's not lasciviousness. Right? But there's this, there's this dangerous gospel that's continued to cripple our communities because it continues to produce in us the rebellion and lawlessness and this false assurance. We're continuing to willfully sin and walk in rebellion. And we feel like it's okay because of what we see. And, 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 and this, this is why I say it's dangerous, right? And this is what this is what really it irks me, man. So one, it carries a spirit of pride and rebellion, which leads to hypocrisy and, and, and pharisaical self-righteous behavior, where individuals feel like they can live however they want to live based on their own standard and living in all of these gray areas, forsaking the standard of the Most High God, right? But this constant, this, this, this consistent desire to, to modernize what people don't understand is just rooted in this coexistence philosophy of the enemy that is pro that is that is progressing individuals and preparing them for this one world faith right it's preparing them for this one world faith and outside of that right there's this there's this push against looking at what happened and what worked and stuff like that because like when we see and understand that we get clues to a lot of stuff that the Father needs us to see, right? But this is very relevant for right now because of the awakening that is happening, right? There is a lot of individuals in this nation who are awakening, right? Whether these individuals are descendants of Israel or whether they are individuals who are outside of Israel but are receiving a conviction to come back to the ways of how the early church operated, there is an awakening. They see what's wrong. The Holy Spirit is stirring. The prophecies are being fulfilled and stuff is being written on individuals. Individual, like there is a revival and an awakening happening right now. Right? And it's significant within the black community as well because in a lot of different parts of the world, there's an understanding of, of this, this gathering of those who have been scattered through the earth, right? And one of the last places, I, and I, I talked about this like, like a couple years back in like an old, old, old lesson. Right. But one thing that is significant is one of the last places that people are looking for that to happen is here in America. But it's happening in America. But people don't see it. Right. But this is what. So you got to understand what Satan is doing as 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 the father is fulfilling prophecy. This contemporary gospel. There's a lot of movements that are mobilizing that, are, again, are rushing into our communities and our churches that are directly counter what the father's doing. Like they're directly like, like the easiest, it's just, it's just, it's just, just they're opposite of what the, they're opposite the gospel. <laughs> they're opposite the gospel of the kingdom. They're opposite the gospel of Christ. They're, they're, it's all about, 
it's, 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 it's the spirit of pride, rebellion, and lawlessness. And it is to me, it's very significant that Satan is accelerating these movements in the black communities as the Father is accelerating prophecies here in this nation. Because he's already been doing it in the other nations. Like, you can go and look at the documentaries and do your research. But this is one of the last battlegrounds where he is starting to, to stir up his people. Right? And, and, and whether you are there and understanding... What If you're listening to this message, more than likely it's because there's a call and there's a conviction on your heart from the Holy Spirit, right? From the God of the Bible that is calling you to a different, to a deeper place that is more authentic and more in tune with what he's doing in this hour, right? In the contemporary gospel that we see being produced out there, it's contrary to what the Father is doing and it is designed to directly oppose what is happening in this hour. And it's designed to keep individuals blind to what is happening in this hour. It is a doctrine that is teaching people that it's okay to come to Christ yet not change. It's a doctrine that's teaching people it's okay to come to Christ and still live according to the world. It's a doctrine that's teaching people it's okay to come to Christ and develop in all kind of manners that's going to allow you to still be given over to the pride of life, the cares of this world, to be carnal-minded, to be worldly, to be adulterous of the spirit against the most high God and to, to compromise and live in an area of greatness that, that we're not called to. It, it, it doesn't call you to be set apart. It calls you to blend in for the sake of coexisting so that way you can draw other individuals. And that's counter, that's counter scripture, right? When Paul said, become all things to win a few, that's not what he was talking about, right? 